Hi, everyone. My name is Matt Brown. I am a solutions architect here at Endor Labs. My name is Omar Kimbaya. I am a principal field security specialist at GitHub. Good to see you again, Omar. Many people may not know this or do know this, but Omar and I used to work together. And uh, it's just great to be working with you again, man. Yeah, it's good to be working with you at arm's length this time, as opposed to like in right? the same organization. Yeah, we exactly. have like two companies separating us, so it feels pretty good. It's a good distance. It's, it's a lot better now, right? Yeah, social distancing is very important. <laughs> exactly. So as you can see, Omar and I work really well together. And we're going to kind of talk about how you can fix vulnerabilities found in your software composition analysis and your open source components as well as your static code analysis uh, without leaving GitHub at all. So we're going to use Endor Labs for SCA, and we're going to use GitHub Advanced Security for stack analysis to fix vulnerabilities without ever actually leaving GitHub. So that's what the title of this talk is, and we can go ahead and get right into it. Now, I'm going to kind of set the stage here, and we're going to all pretend that Omar and I work together at this imaginary company. It's called... Madeline, Golden Goose. Emily, that Golden, Golden Goose, Goose Security. Golden yeah. Goose Security. This is where we work, is Golden Goose Security. And at Golden Goose Security, my uh, my title is I'm an application security manager, right? application security engineering manager. And Omar is the VP of engineering at our company. Oh, and we oh. have a little bit, <laughs> we have a little bit of a problem here at our company. We have a big challenge where I can't really get Omar's team to quickly and effectively fix vulnerabilities. And it's not their fault. It's not Omar's fault or Omar's team's fault, anything like that. It's just they are so inundated with noise, especially from their SCA tool, right? So what we did is we went out and we, we got Endor Labs and we're going to actually start to, from my point of view, set specific policies with which they're not inundated with noise. They're, we're not going to break every build. We're going to set up these policies so that we can finally help the engineering team answer that question of, well, what the heck do I actually have to fix first? So that is the goal of this. We're going to walk through that. And then after we have those policies set up, we look at some results from those uh, policies that are in effect. And then Omar is going to take it from there and talk about how he uses GitHub Advanced Security for static analysis in CoQL in order to effectively remediate vulnerabilities. And again, we're going to all do this in GitHub. The only time we're not going to be in GitHub is when we're going to set up the policies for SCA from Endor Labs. And you'll see why we do that, right? So quite we can get preamble. right into it. <laughs> quite, the, quite the preamble. So we can get right into it. Here I am in Endor Labs. We have our little projects here, project here. Uh, our project at Golden Goose Security is we're consultants and we're making a website for Madeline, Emily, and Jade's bakery. They have their own little bakery and they want a website. So, so we're going to we're gonna make it nice and secure for them. And for those who don't know, that's the name of our daughters. I have two girls. Omar has one girl. Those are the gir girls' names. So... I'm going to go into policies in Endor Labs, and I'm going to create an action policy. We have finding policies that go ahead and enable that obviously find vulnerabilities, as you can see here. Then we have action policies where we're going to get super, super fine-grained and only break specific builds, only block certain PRs. Then so we're not blocking or breaking every single build or PR. <clears throat> but go ahead and edit this policy before... And typically, kind of what led us to this problem that Omar and I have about the engineering team just not knowing what to fix first is that we would set the policies from our previous capabilities, our previous tools, our traditional SCA tooling to things like, okay, fail it if it's critical and a fix available, right? You know, if it's exploitable, sure, you could do that as well. That's another good one. I don't want any test dependencies. I can go ahead and, you know, exclude my test dependencies, right? But what resulted in that was there's just too many broken builds and there's just too many alerts. So two things happened. They got inundated with alerts and pinged all the time. And because we broke every build, no build was broken. What do I mean by that? 
When everything's an emergency, nothing's an emergency. What we want is for when this error pops up, when this failed build or failed pull request pops up, we want to have that person say, well, hang on a second. This doesn't usually happen. This is weird. I'm getting a broken build. This is weird that my PR is failing. I should really kind of take a step back and really think about what I'm doing here. I probably have a critical vulnerability that's pretty dangerous. So I want to take that seriously. So we're going to set the severity to critical. Is there a fix available? Yes. Is there direct dependency? We're going to pick yes, because those are very easy to fix. Direct dependency is way easier to fix than a transitive one, but you could also pick transits as well as you want to. But again, I want to make the engineering team's lives way easier. We're going to make this easier for them. Is the dependency reachable, meaning is the code that our company writes, does that actually call an open source component itself? Is it actually using the dependency itself? Yes. <clears throat> then is the function reachable? I may be calling a certain part of a dependency that's not reachable, a function in that dependency that's not reachable. That one takes less of a priority than a dependency with which I'm calling a function that contains the vulnerability inside of it. That one needs to take more priority over it. So you have reachable dependency, reachable function. I'm going to exclude test dependencies. You could say EPSS, the Exploitability Predictability Scoring System. That's the percentage with which in the next 30 days, it is X percent likely to be exploited, this particular vulnerability. Me being in security, if we're going to be using this function or this method, exploitable or not, I still want to take care of it. But again, depending upon your risk, you can choose to pick something else. And then, of course, we're going to enforce it. We're going to break the build if that happens. And again, I can kind of tweak this even further to say, hey, if it's this dependency, you can exclude it. If it's that package name, you can exclude it or include it, whatever have you, right? Certain ecosystem. Really, really fine grain policy. And then I'm going to call this priority to fix. These are critical and reachable. This breaks the build or fails a PR. If a vulnerability is critical, fixable in a direct dependency and reachable, we can tag it with priority. So go ahead and update that. Now I have this policy in place. That's all I have to do in Endor. As far as getting everything now into GitHub. So really super simple to set up here. We actually want to even look at the GitHub action. We, we totally could. We're going to go ahead and go into workflows, my main.yaml. Here is your GitHub action for Endor Labs. We actually run the test. We're going to go ahead and upload it to Serif. And now what's going to happen is the results from Endor Labs that run in this GitHub action with effect in my policy are going to end up into the security tabs within GitHub Advanced Security. So you can go ahead and run that workflow. We've already run it, but it will chug along and go through. We actually want to go ahead and take a look at how this is going. We can actually go in, check out the build. Now, this is a Java Maven application. So we're going to do, obviously, a few things like Maven install, um, you know, really just set up the project and then go ahead and run the test. While this is running, Omar, what's your favorite programming language? Python, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> have you ever heard of this thing? Have you ever heard of this thing called phantom dependencies? It's phantom. almost Halloween. Okay, you know? tell me about that spooky dependency. So these phantom dependencies, there's some cases in Python. This is actually kind of cool, where... They're not, a dependency is not declared anywhere, literally nowhere, yet they end up inside of your application. They're not declared anywhere. You don't declare like TensorFlow or, you know, PyTor, whatever, right? You don't, they're not in the requirements.txt, not in anywhere. And I'm not talking like the transitive dependencies, right? Those are the ones you don't know bring, like the direct dependency, you know. But these phantom dependencies are the dependencies with which 
you have no idea that they're brought in because they're literally not declared anywhere. So it's a great blog post on fan dependencies. I'll send it to you, Omar. So you have something to read about. Yeah, send me that link because that sounds pretty I, wild and spooky. Definitely I can do. use a scare today. Right? So job's done here. A couple minutes. We've gone through, we've tested, and you can see here we failed the build because there was a critical, reachable vulnerability that is fixable, all that really good stuff that we said in our policy. So now we go into the security tab, we go into code scanning. We can see, hey, Endor's reporting an error, it's failing the build. And that is because we go ahead and filter this down by tag and we can see reachable function. Which one of my security alerts for SCA within Endor CTL from you know that tool contains a reachable function one? Now you can tell and you can see if we actually go ahead and look at the results from the project itself, way more than one, right? There's a lot more findings than just one finding. In fact, there's about 34, 34 vulnerabilities here. So what am I going to do? Give Omar 34 tickets to create? No, I don't want to do that. I don't want his team to go through that and say, well, we're not using this one. I'm going to give him literally one to go ahead and fix. If I go in there, we're going to tell, we're going to say, okay, we've opened this. We're going to go ahead to say, here's how you actually fix it. And then I can go ahead and create an issue for Omar to say, wouldn't you know, could you please get this fixed? You could say critical and reachable, something like that. And then I can go ahead, submit a new issue, and the issue is now assigned to Omar. I can go ahead and give it to Omar, label it, all these really cool features within GitHub. Now you'll notice I haven't left GitHub. I've gotten the alert in GitHub. I've gotten what I have to fix in GitHub. I've created a GitHub issue. Now Omar's going to get this information to go ahead and look at this issue. He's going to get the fix for it. And if somebody on his team wants more information, maybe some proof, we can go ahead and show them the call graph that we generate for each one of these. And we can get this remediated. So, that's how we get SCA, the software composition analysis, those open source dependencies or vulnerabilities. That's how we get the ones that we really have to focus on, we really need to fix. And we were helping those en that engineering team answer the question of, what do I have to fix first? Here's what you have to fix. This is critical, reachable, fixable. This is your priority. But now, let's talk about static analysis using GitHub, Advanced Security, and CodeQL. And Omar, I'll hand it off to you. Cool. Thank you. There is one other thing I do want to, while Matt is uh, allowing me to yeah. share the screen here, Absolutely. one more thing I do want to point out from a developer perspective, we don't just have like one or two or you know five different dependencies that we have to be concerned about. If we're looking at something at scale, if we're looking at something that is, we have hundreds of repositories, upon thousands of repositories, and each of those are using a large amount of open source code, if we're getting alerts for everything across the board, there's no real way for us to understand or have a better idea of how to prioritize that work. So what Endor Labs is really helping with is helping us prioritize by showing us what are the things that are most easily accessible for exploitation. So that really narrows it down to the things that should be prioritized that allows developers to understand like, okay, well, now I just have to upgrade this dependency to this version, and that will go ahead and take care of that issue. Everything else, although they are vulnerabilities, they're not necessarily reachable and they're not necessarily a high priority at the time, which is really helpful for developers in time crunches. When they need to push something up for a release, they need to put out in the next hot fix. That is one way that they can perform that sort of work. It's like you've done this before, Omar. <laughs> yes. So the uh, from again from like a developer perspective, right? GitHub is a really great place for us to collaborate 
on our code in terms of designing, in terms of planning, in terms of writing, in terms of reviewing, in terms of deploying, all these different opportunities for us to be able to work together on this code. And if we really want to have like a strong DevOps culture or a DevSecOps culture, it is important for us to have at least a good communication with the security team, or at least a, a decent relationship with them. That way we both have trust between each other, that they understand that we're under time crunches and we have a lot of things that we have to do. We understand that they have you know business continuity to worry about, to make sure that customer data is safe, that the company's data is safe all of those different things. So as long as we have that general understanding are able to communicate in helpful ways, uh, that will allow us to maintain that sort of DevSecOps culture. But on top of that, we need to be able to have platforms or areas in which we can have that communication. And that's where GitHub and GitHub Advanced Security really can help in that regard. So throughout my side of the demonstration, I really want to kind of showcase that from a static analysis perspective, as well as a secret scanning perspective. So back in here in our repository, you know, we've uh, you know added some new commits, we've added some new code. Now, as a as a manager, engineering manager, I want to understand, okay, well, where are our vulnerabilities from uh, our static analysis perspective? So what I can do is I can go into my security tab within my repository because we're focused on the repository here. But if I want to see things from a more global level, let's say at an organizational level, because uh, GitHub, you have an enterprise and you can have many sort of orgs within that uh, that enterprise. And then within each org, you can have many, many repositories. So it allows us to kind of group everything up and be able to see things there. We're just kind of showcasing this from a, uh, a smaller perspective. So that's what we're going to be doing here. So I want to be able to look at code scanning because this will allow us to see, you know, scans from not just from CodeQL or Endor Labs, but pretty much any other sort of tool that you can find on a GitHub Action Marketplace that will be able to upload Serif to GitHub, you'll be able to see the results here. And if I want to narrow it down to CodeQL, I can just by clicking on CodeQL, and I'm able to see everything that is specific to CodeQL. And so if I see here that I have four critical vulnerabilities in my code, that is something that I want to be able to look at. But here's the thing, CodeQL isn't like a lot of the other sort of uh, static analysis tools that are out there. What really makes it unique, specifically on the compiled language side, is that it does have hooks into compilers that allows us to see the complete data flow, how the code is put together in order for us to identify source and sync. So we're not really doing any sort of guesses, and we're also removing a lot of the false positives that come through guessing when you're just looking at a code or trying to do some sort of binary analysis. This is something that we would refer to as more of a comprehensive static analysis type of scan. So if we understand uh, all the different places where data can flow from one place to another, from two to three to 40 to however many different hops it gets through from source to sync, we'll be able to, to extract that from the code, save it to a database, and then run a series of queries that are written in code QL, which is the language or the QL language uh, that's somewhat similar to Java, if you will. And you can write those queries or use the prepackaged queries that we have within GitHub and have those run against those databases or the database that you've created for a particular project and be able to see, hey, here are the issues that I've been able to identify using CodeQL. And by and large, you're going to see that CodeQL does have less in terms of results, but that's because we're much more accurate because we have a much clearer picture of how the code is put together. So here, even though we don't have you know too many files in this particular uh, repository, we do have some critical ones that we at least want to be able to pay attention to. So if I'm going to look at this server-side request forgery, I can come into that particular alert and see, okay, where is the sync in this code? And if I want to be see, if I want to be able to see that full, you know, source to sync type of data flow, I can view that all within here. Additionally, if I want to be able to understand, you know, how can I fix this particular issue? There are recommendations and examples within languages that were that are being used in order for us to be get a better idea of how to make this work. But I don't expect developers to come here first. What I expect developers to do are to go into their issues. And so 
I can create an issue from a particular alert and I've already done that. So I'll just click over into this issue and you can see here, here's the issue I created. I assigned it to myself and it does have a link for tracking that particular issue. And then from a git commit perspective, if I'm working on that particular issue, I can make reference to it in my commit message. And then that will go ahead and get checked in. And if I'm going to address this particular one, it'll all be tracked within this particular issue view. So I don't have to leave GitHub in order to see this information. The only time I would leave GitHub would be to actually write the code and actually work on it. So CodeQL can run uh, on a timely basis on a schedule. You can run it on for PRs or for pushes, you know, however it is that you want to be able to uh, run it. It's very flexible. Same thing with Indoor Labs. Uh, with GitHub Actions, it does make things very easy and flexible for you to use all within GitHub. But the next thing that we're able to do is going to be identifying secrets within your code base and then also preventing new secrets from being added into your commit history. So what I'll do is I'll go to secret scanning within my security tab here. And you'll see that I have three different secrets that we've been able to identify within this repository. And two of them are active. We do have partnerships with different vendors out there and we have a secure API that we're able to send over a secret and ask, is this active? Yes or no. And they'll return, you know, saying like, no, this is not active or yes, this is active. And if we're not able to tell, then we just say, hey, this is a possibly act active secret. Because if we can't prove that it's not, then we're going to assume that it is active. So in this case, I see that I have these three different uh, secrets here. And if I click into any of them, I can see like, okay, what is the secret? And specifically, where is the secret in the Git um, within my repository? Then how do I deal with these secrets in my commit history? There are tools that you can use to remove them from Git history, but by and large, the first thing that you'll want to do is rotate those secrets and use some sort of secret management tool in order to you know, keep those secrets secret and not all over your code base. But this is for secrets that already exist. I want to learn about secrets that are, I want to stop secrets from being added into my repository. So for this really quick example, I'm creating a new file. And what you can see here is that I've added a GitHub token. This is a non-active GitHub token with zero permissions. And if I'm gonna go ahead and just commit the changes from here, I wanna commit directly to the main branch. You'll see here that I am stopped immediately because the way that secret scanning push protection will work is it works as a pre-receive hook. So we send the commit over to GitHub and before we commit it to or add it to the, the Git history, we'll do that secret uh, scan. And then when we identify it, we'll say, hey, we don't want this. And this isn't just unique to the browser experience. This is going to be something for any sort of Git client that you use, whether it be a Git graphical user interface or you're using Git from the CLI or within an IDE, uh, you'll be able to have a similar experience that will go ahead and warn you, hey, secret has been identified, You know, do something about this. We don't want this to be a part of our Git history. And then you can go ahead and re uh, remove it from there and rotate those secrets. So really quickly, just a, a very quick and easy sort of uh, summary here. You know, we've talked about SCA, looking at code, being able to identify the areas where we need to remediate, uh, basically for any sort of reachable function that will reduce, significantly reduce the amount of noise that we get from any sort of SCA tool. We've talked about how to be able to run static analysis, especially at scale with code QL in GitHub, as well as look at secret scanning and identifying secrets, as well as uh, preventing new secrets from getting into your code base. And this is all within one platform. Matt, do you have any other comments that you want to make here? Yeah, I, I thought that was a really nice summary, Omar. Um, what do you say we do one more thing? I, I want to try one more thing if, if you're okay with it. You have okay, a few Steve minutes. Job, show me what you got. <laughs> yeah, you know, I tried my best, right? So you mentioned remediate, right? You mentioned actually fixing stuff. I think that that doesn't really get shared a ton. Like, okay, all these tools, you've demoed how you've gone ahead and show me how to fix it, things like that. Why don't we just fix something? 
Let's see how it works, right? So I also assigned this issue to myself. So now you and I are both responsible for fixing this. Let's just fix it. (laughs) I know, right? So, all right, this component is telling me I got to go from 1.9 to 1.10 for Apache Commons text, okay? So let's go to the code and let's open a code space. Might as well, right? This I like love, by the way. I love doing this. So... And Omar, I might need your help navigating in a second, but that's the beauty of it. We work so well together. So now I know that I have my palm.xml here. Playing it loose. <laughs> right? I know, right? Yeah, we'll close the readme for now. So we have code spaces here and we have our component, this Apache Commons text, right? What's the fix again? All it is, is go from 1.9 to 1.10. Oh, I can save it. Oops. I can go ahead and I can actually commit it right onto me. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and commit. Need to put yes. a message in there first. We'll need to put a message in there first. You also want to add uh, add the, the file, add the change that you want to commit. So you see the little plus Great. button where it says Ponda XML? Oh yeah. Yeah, you gotta add it. Now it's staged. That's right. Now it's now staged. You commit message. Yeah. You can write the message right now. There. Yeah. yeah, perfect. So now I'm gonna write this commit message. And what we can even do is go to the issue and we can say fixing this issue. Fixing. There we go. Copy that. We can say that we're going to fix. Fixing that. Thank you. We can commit and push. Is this what I'm going to do? So now what should be happening is in our GitHub Actions, we have this going. And as you can see here, we're building. And now, because I've gone ahead and I've fixed that critical issue, the policy to go ahead and continue and not fail. Because we fixed that critical that was also reachable. And just like that, it's super duper easy to go ahead and fix effectively. And by the way, and we'll reiterate it, we haven't left GitHub. We've been in GitHub this whole time. So let's let this finish up building. And we will see that we're scanning. We'll go ahead, we're gonna build those call graphs. We're gonna stitch them together to see what's reachable. And in just a moment, we're going to see that the policy will have let us continue. It's going to happen Omar, soon. It'll happen, happen soon, soon, any minute. Just and Omar, I want to say it's been great, great doing this talk with you. It really, it's been great doing this talk with you. It's uh, brought me back to the old days, you know? Yeah. What was it that Andy said in the office? Like, I wish you would knew that you were in the old days. Um, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh man any sort of office fans out there can correct me in the Q&A <laughs> exactly there we go we can yeah. see scan completed successfully so we've not only shown you how to manage vulnerabilities without ever leaving GitHub, leaving GitHub we've shown you how to fix them too once you get alerted to them 